Good afternoon. I'm Cindy Arnson, the director of the Wilson Center's Latin American program. Pleased to welcome our guests today, as well as all of you in the audience for this important discussion on the United States relationship with Colombia. About six weeks ago, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien and CEO of the International Development Finance Corporation, Adam Bowler, visited Colombia. And during that trip, the United States and Colombia launched Colombia Crece, Colombia Grows, which the Colombian Embassy here in Washington has described as, and I quote, as an initiative to strengthen the rule of law, combat crime, and at the same time, invest in development, job creation, water, education, electricity, and infrastructure in rural and vulnerable Colombian communities. The details about Colombia Crece are still being worked out, but it's clear that a key focus is on rural development, not only to enhance security, but also to bring key infrastructure, uh, tertiary roads, electricity, water, education, to the nearly 10 million people, almost 20% of the Colombian population who live in rural areas. The Colombian and US governments have already made significant efforts to attract private sector investment to these underserved areas. And there are many positive stories to tell. Yet there are still important questions. Is there a security environment sufficient to attract rural investment? What legal and or regulatory reforms might be needed to make this possible? And how can the US and Colombian governments and the private sectors in both countries do more on behalf of a rural development strategy? We have a truly stellar group of experts from Colombia and the United States joining us to reflect on these questions. First, we'll hear from US Ambassador to Colombia, Philip Goldberg. Ambassador Goldberg holds the, per the, rank, the personal rank of career ambassador, the highest rank in the US Foreign Service. He was confirmed as US Ambassador to Colombia in August of 2019. He has also served as ambassador to Bolivia, deputy chief of mission in Chile, and charge d'affaires at the US Embassy in, in Cuba. And early in his career and adding to his expertise on Colombia, he was posted to Bogota as the coordinator of Plan Colombia many years ago. Next, we will hear from Emilio Archila, Colombia's High Commissioner for Stabilization and Consolidation. Mr. Archila is a specialist in financial law and international development law. He previously served as director of the Department of Economic Law at Colombia's Universidad Externado and as head of the legal office of the Ministry of Economic Development, among many other posts in the public and private sectors. Maria Claudia Lacouture is the executive director of the Colombian American Chamber of Commerce usually known as the AmCham Colombia. She is an expert in finance and international relations and is a former minister of trade, industry and tourism and former president of Pro Colombia, the government agency in, in charge of attracting um, or promoting non-traditional exports, international tourism and foreign investment. And finally, Dan Restrepo is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress here in Washington, DC. He served in the Obama White House for six years, including three and a half years as the special assistant to the president and senior director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council. Dan previously was a member of the professional staff of the US House of Representatives um, Committee on Foreign Affairs. Um, thank you all for joining us. I'd like to invite everyone in the audience, if you have a question, to please send it to our Twitter account, which is at LATAMPROG, L-A-T-A-M-P-R-O-G, and we'll take as many questions from the audience as we can. Ambassador Goldberg, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Cindy, and good afternoon to everyone watching. Uh, it's great to be back on a Wilson Center event. Uh, Cindy alluded to uh, the fact that I've been in Colombia a couple of times before. The first time uh, I arrived was more than 30 years ago uh, when the country was going through a terrible period uh, fighting uh, narco trafficking cartels uh, and widespread conflict uh, 
uh, questioned Columbia's stability at the time uh, and ability to overcome that period. And, and they did. Uh, Columbia has made remarkable progress. And I saw it again 20 years ago when I uh, came back to uh, be the first coordinator uh, for Plan Columbia. Uh, Plan Columbia was uh, envisioned as a binational whole of government approach to address the continued violence and lawlessness uh, wrought by insurgents and the narco trafficking that funded their operations. Through an integrated approach uh, focused on uh, security assistance, rural development, and rule of law, the Colombian government and people uh, ended the Western Hemisphere's longest uh, running conflict. And it came in two parts, first uh, with agreements with paramilitary groups, and then, uh, of course, the agreement in 2016, we're now celebrating the uh, fourth anniversary of the agreement with the FARC. Although some have uh, criticized uh, the approach that we took uh, before the peace agreement, the historic peace accord was a direct result uh, of the Colombian government's uh, strong efforts. Colombia's uh, commitment and resolve dramatically improved security and rule of law uh, and brought insurgent groups to the negotiating table. But the work isn't complete. Uh, now we're in a new phase. Some of the problems that we face were unintended outgrowths of that peace agreement. Uh, drugs again, uh, and especially coca production uh, exploded. Uh, some of that, and, and uh, President Santos, I think, would be one of the people who would uh, admit that this, uh, that, that the approach during the peace uh, talks uh, allowed some of the uh, coca growth uh, to increase. There were some perverse incentives included in the agreement, and we're now addressing some of those issues. At the same time, while most of the FARC, the vast majority, have come in, and many parts of the agreement uh, uh, is uh, working very well. There are some uh, groups that are still out there funding their activities through drugs and coca production. Uh, the ELN is still there. Uh, there are FARC dissidents, those who didn't come into the process or have been recruited since, and those who are in paramilitary groups who uh, then uh, became uh, nothing more than uh, narco trafficking cartels, the biggest one being the Clan del Golfo. But thanks to the peace accord, Colombia uh, is able to broaden its focus on security to make more progress on economic development and rule of law. The US-Colombia Growth Initiative, what we're calling it here, uh, the Joint Action Plan, as some in the Colombian government are calling it, accelerates and expands uh, this trajectory, this ability uh, to do more on economic development and rule of law, harnessing the power of the private sector to reverse decades of isolation in vulnerable uh, rural communities. The 2016 Accord opened new opportunities for investment and state presence in areas formerly uh, unreachable during the conflict and historically forgotten. I was reminded of this just this past Sunday when I accompanied uh, President Duque and, and several ministers and, and counselors in the government to an area in Guaviare that would have been unreachable some years ago, where we were able to build a school and where there's much more uh, opportunity to bring development to the area. Uh, this initiative that we're undertaking now will stay, uh, strengthen that state presence uh, catalyze private investment and support sustainable licit economies in isolated uh, rural economies affected by violence and armed conflict. But as Cindy said, this is the broad outline of what we're proposing. Many of the details remain to be uh, filled in in terms of the terms of uh, the agreement, uh, the loans and equity investments that might be on offer, uh, as uh, well as some of the other uh, details. We estimate the value of uh, embassy programming integrated across uh, counter narcotics development and security uh, in support of this program at over $1.2 billion in the first three years of the initiative. Uh, it might very well be more. It also has to do with certain absorption uh, capacity as well. We'll work hand in hand with our partners to uh, sustainably eradicate COCA 
increase citizen security, create licit jobs, and uh, foster integrated rural development in the targeted areas, which include the Pedets in which uh, Councillor Archila uh, is working, uh, as well as the Zonas Futuro, uh, which Dr. Guarin, the National Security Advisor, uh, is uh, working on. So it's, uh, again, a whole of government approach. It's, it's very much consistent with what we've always been uh, doing with the Colombian government in extending state presence and trying to bring along economic development uh, to deal with uh, the, those who are involved in illegal activities, especially coca production. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, Councillor Archilla will speak more about uh, the subsidies uh, and other efforts to bring other crops and illicit crops to agricultural producers. But that's, that's the idea. And so that we have uh, uh, a, uh, a pot of money through equity uh, and loans uh, that will be available to help harness also the kind of private sector invest investment that Maria, uh, Maria Claudia will uh, speak to. Uh, we have this strong base to build on. Over the past several years, our support has uh, developed illicit economies and value chains in rural conflicted uh, affected communities. Uh, we've helped illicit uh, producers increase their sales by a total of over $40 million in the past five years. We've also helped build over 3,000 uh, kilometers of tertiary roads since 2014, benefiting over 223,000 rural residents to ensure cacao, coffee, fruit, milk, cheese, and uh, rubber reach their intended markets, because obviously you need the infrastructure to achieve that. A few tools are more effective than land titles uh, in providing a strong incentive to abandon coca and uh, sparking uh, sustainable economic growth. For this reason, we've helped uh, the Colombian government to deliver over 3,300 land titles to rural conflict affected families since 2014, starting with a pilot uh, program in the town of Ovejas in Sucre, a critical milestone of the peace accord, and now scaling up across the country. This is going to be vital to give people uh, a real interest and title to property. Colombia's social leaders and human rights defenders play an essential role in rural peace and development, and we focused on that uh, as well, uh, on uh, getting people away from uh, illicit economies to licit ones, uh, promoting ethnic inclusion, labor rights, and state presence. Aggressions against them continue, and this is a very serious problem, and our assistance is helping the Colombian government address this troubling trend through greater prevention, protection, and accountability. We know that achieving uh, lasting peace and economic development in Colombia's rural areas requires greater police presence to provide uh, citizen security and establish the rule of law. We're helping nearly 50,000 rural communities use alternative methods to resolve over 4,400 uh, disputes. We're working with the Colombian National Police to expand their permanent rural presence by building rural police bases in strategic areas plagued by narco trafficking and building trust with the communities they serve. Last March, I inaugurated the first US supported rural police base in Caceres in Antioquia, which will bring nearly 50 additional police to this uh, priority area of uh, Bajo uh, Cauca. We are constructing more uh, bases this year and will continue to work with the police to extend their presence, community outreach, and the rule of law across rural Colombia. We also included in that police base where we established in uh, Caceres uh, uh, an office also for a fiscal, uh, for a prosecutor, so that the rule of law is also introduced into the uh, police uh, presence. Uh, we don't ignore the difficult situation many regions of Colombia still face. Violence and instability caused by illegal groups uh, is still present. Uh, I mentioned some of the outgrowths of the peace agreement, but some of these uh, groups that are still there uh, are going to fight us as we try to introduce more uh, of a state presence and 
uh, more illicit economies because it's not in their interest. It's not the coca producers who are making so much out of this as much as these illegal groups that run the narco trafficking chain. Coca cultivation remains a key driver of the conflict and we continue to work on that very strongly uh, with the uh, Colombian uh, government and with the defense ministry, the police uh, and the military. We uh, recognize our work is inter interdependent and successful expansion of state presence can only be achieved when we effectively coordinate our programs on the ground. So we are trying to bring this all uh, together. Colombia has come a long way uh, in the last uh, 30 years and especially the 20 years since uh, the introduction of Plan Colombia and continues down the long road to sustain peace and prosperity. Uh, I would just say from personal experience that maybe 60% of the country uh, 20 years ago was outside of uh, government control. That may be now 15%. So you can see the kind of progress that's been made in establishing that state presence. What hasn't been as successful, but has happened is bringing the economic development uh, to uh, these regions and also to uh, go after now the remaining uh, problems that exist in the narco trafficking, the coca production and the illegality in these areas as evidenced by attacks on social leaders uh, in indigenous and Afro-Colombian uh, communities. Uh, so uh, this is what we have in mind. Uh, and uh, we want to be able to add to our, our basket of options uh, to help Colombia as it moves along. It's in a great interest of the United States uh, as it always has been. Uh, we have a tremendous investment here. It's always been bipartisan. The US Congress has helped us uh, fund these programs uh, from both sides of the aisle. Uh, and we uh, will now have this uh, DFC, International Development Finance Corporation uh, program to help further uh, those efforts. And that's what we're trying to organize uh, with the Colombian government. Uh, but the broad outline is there, uh, but many of the details remain to be filled in and how we involve the private sector uh, as well in developing these programs. So with that, Cindy, I yield the floor. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Ambassador Goldberg. Uh, Emilio Artila, if you could unmute, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christian, uh, Cynthia, for uh, organizing this. Uh, also, uh, I am feel very comfortable to be back in the Wilson Center. It's, uh, I think the third or fourth time that we have had this uh, this opportunity and I really appreciate it. I appreciate the work that you do and uh, I appreciate the high level discussions that we handle. So um, uh, always that, that I come to this floor, I am a little bit nervous. Uh, so uh, let me start by explaining that uh, we will not cover everything that we are doing we will uh, focus in, in two main uh, main uh, of the of the programs. This is the uh, development plans with territorial emphasis, the PEDETS, like, and then uh, what we are doing in voluntary substitution of coca. Those are the two programs that uh, we do think that uh, are very close with uh, what uh, we intend to do now. Uh, it, it, it has always been identified that uh, there are some areas of uh, the Colombian country that are uh, tough to bring in the peace. And uh, we have learned uh, out of the work that we have done with, uh, with the US, uh, what is it that makes it so tough? And uh, it comes to a, so to, to a very um, um, simple uh, um, a combination of factors. One is the Colombian geography is very difficult. We have uh, three, uh, three cordilleras, three, three uh, rows of, of mountains that cross the whole country. So when you want to go uh, from west to east, uh, advancing uh, just a, a few kilometers, it's difficult. And then those territories are full with jungle. So it is really difficult to go from one place to the other. 
Then uh, in, the, uh, in the areas that uh, Ambassador uh, was uh, describing, that 15% that 15, uh, that 15% where we have not been able to, to accomplish, that's 15% of the uh, population, but it's one third of the territory. So we are talking about a uh, huge, uh, huge, uh, huge areas. Uh, and uh, that combination uh, uh, enables uh, the criminals. Uh, it could be coca, it could be marijuana, it could be gold, it could be um, uh, oil uh, uh, smuggling. That, that enables those, those people not only to, uh, to do the, their, their bad job, but to, in fact, take control of the territory. So uh, in what we are doing with uh, the development plans with territorial emphasis is that we have realized that it is not a matter just of uh, a socioeconomic equality of fairness with uh, these 6.6 uh, .6 Colombians. It is a matter of security for Colombia that we take the state presence to those places and that we create the conditions so that uh, <clears throat> private investment uh, is uh, possible and profitable. There are uh, two other lessons that we have learned. One is um, every time that we have tried to uh, design the plan in Bogota or in Washington or between Bogota and Washington and then go and try to impose it to the communities, it has failed. So we know now that we need to work with the people and we, need, we know that we need to ask the people how is it that they want their own development. The second, uh, uh, the second um, um, uh, the lesson that we have, uh, we have learned, especially the, from, uh, from Plan Colombia's uh, experience is that uh, this will never be done in a single presidential period. It is impossible to do it uh, in four years. It needs to have uh, the 12 or the 15 years that it is provided for in the completion of the agreements. So with, uh, with those lessons in, the, in mind, uh, we decided uh, which were the, 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 the areas of the country that were more affected by violence and poverty that guided us uh, to 170 municipalities and those 170 municipalities are grouped in 16 regions that we call the Pedet regions. In each one of those regions, we went to the territories. We spent 18 months asking the people uh, acre by acre, uh, municipality by municipality, and then at the regional level, what is it that they want? What is their expectations? How they want to see the development of their own territory? That ended up in the participation of more than 220,000 people. That means that uh, one out of eight, uh, uh, eight uh, households in, in those territories participated directly in the identification of their necessities. That is uh, 32,000 uh, uh, requests. Those uh, 32,000 requests are grouped or correspond to eight chapters. And those eight chapters embrace uh, all the, the areas of the socioeconomic development, health, roads, education, economic de de development, territory uh, organization, uh, their own reconciliation and, uh, and so. Once we have uh, we had uh, this uh, this identification, uh, we started to make out of those uh, requests a, a plan. We hired Deloitte, and uh, we introduced in our national development plan uh, the idea of the unique road route map for each one of the sixteen regions, so that uh, we can gather all the planning schemes that are applicable to to those regions. We hired Deloitte. Deloitte made uh, the first one, that is the one for the Catatumbo, and we are working in delivering the other fifteen. Meanwhile, we need to focus or to concentrate some uh, investments. And it was always thought that not only this aspect, but all the aspects of the implementation of the agreements with the FARC uh, in the way that we do it through our policy of uh, 
is with legality. It was always understood that we needed the national budget, we needed uh, the uh, departments, we needed uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, support of the um, international community and also the, the private sector. We changed uh, the rules for the administration of uh, uh, the seven percent of the royalties. We changed uh, the way that we work uh, an instrument that is called work for taxes. That instrument uh, permits uh, individuals and corporations not to pay the full amount of their income uh, income tax, but up to fifty percent to invest it directly in the competition of these uh, initiatives of, uh, of the communities. Between uh, one and, uh, and the other instrument at this moment, since uh, August of last year to today, we have a more or less 400 US million dollars in, uh, in, in progress to comply with, uh, with those, uh, with those uh, expectations. Um, we have worked uh, with all the international uh, community, in particular with, uh, with USAID, and uh, everything or most everything that uh, Ambassador explained of the things that we were doing uh, since, uh, since a long time ago, we are focusing in, uh, in doing it in those places. And not only doing it in those places, but doing exactly what the, the people ask for. The, this, uh, um, let, let me uh, highlight, is the third characteristic. First one is doing what the people want. Second is real long-term planning. And the third one is we need to decide what to do and we need to decide what not to do. Because in those areas, it is so huge, the necessities are hu so huge that it is possible that anybody that wants to help can go there and uh, ask the people and the people will there tell them something that they need. But we need all the, the investments to be in a, coherent, uh, in a coherent manner. We have done that with, uh, with USAID. We, worked, uh, through a, we went through a workshop that we called a, a click for the pedet. That was uh, absolutely magic. It uh, enabled uh, most of the, uh, of the operators of USA to pick uh, what they were going to do and to align with the, with the, PDET, uh, with the PDET planning. And we will continue to, to do that. In, uh, in, that, uh, in, in, that, uh, in that scenario, uh, at this moment, we can tell exactly what is the economic um, um, uh, strength of each one of those 16 regions. We know if they are good at avocado, coffee, cattling, um, um, cocoa, um, pineapple, or, or whatever. And uh, we also know where are the places where they should be growing and uh, the infrastructure that it is needed to give a value added to those, uh, to those products. Further, we have identified every single road that needs to be constructed uh, for the region uh, for the, 15, uh, the next 15 years. So uh, we have combined this with uh, the identification of where the coca is being grown. In 120 out of the 170 Pedet municipalities, we have more than 95% of the coca. And we have worked not only with uh, the program that we have at this moment that we call uh, the current program, <clears throat> but we have developed other three programs that are specifically designed for the characteristics of each one of the regions where the coca is being grown. We have payment for environmental services in order to go to the national parks uh, when, when the, the coca is there. We, we have developed a, a program that we called a, a substitution with equity for the uh, cases where uh, the coca is being grown, where you have uh, ethnical territories. And we have uh, developed uh, uh, jointly with uh, USAID, uh, what we call um, um, titling for substitution in order to, uh, for the places where the most powerful tool is to give the title to the, to the families. So uh, we know exactly 
where the coca is. We know what uh, a substitution program we need to implement in each one of the places where the coca is being grown. We know uh, what is the, uh, the product that will be commercially sound in order to substitute the coca for that one. And the one that is the magic is that we know what is uh, the uh, ec economic uh, infrastructure that we need to build. That is uh, laboratories, uh, that is uh, warehouses, and, uh, and so that is 333 around, uh, around uh, the 170 municipalities and the roads that we need to build in order to take those products out in a, a commercially competitive uh, manner. So our program is a, a, a program that is comprehensive of substitution, value added, commercial infrastructure, and the roads. The, the amount uh, that that will be uh, worth in the, in the whole, not taking in account uh, other uh, ingredients like the security and so, will be uh, something around uh, uh, 3.5 US million dollars. And to give you uh, an idea, and I will end up uh, there of how intelligent that will be, is first, that it will not be isolated, but it will be part of a long-term plan that we have for those municipalities. Second, that uh, it will amount to a more or less 20% of the internal uh, uh, investment that the U.S. Uh, makes in order to fight drugs in the, in the U.S. So with, uh, with 20%, 20% of what it takes to, uh, in, in an annually basis to, co to fight uh, the drugs inside the, the US, we could uh, have um, a plan in which we will be jointly aiming to get rid of the whole coca that is being grown in Colombia. Thank you so much, Consejero uh, Archila, Maria Claudia, por favor. Thank you, uh, Cindy, for the invitation. It's uh, an honor to be here and to be part of this panel with uh, Ambassador Goldberg, with Abilio, and with uh, Dan. So thank you so much. Let me move to the perspective of the investment of the companies that are investing in Colombia and how we see from uh, the different companies that work with Amcham through the, the interest in investing in our country. One of the main things that we have to start by saying is that U.S. is the largest uh, investor in Latin America. It has more than 3,662 projects in the past decade, and it's been the double uh, what it be the next country that is investing in our country, which is Spain. In Colombia, uh, for the past 10 years, the U.S. is the largest uh, source of greenfield in projects and amount investment in our country with more than 360 projects representing more than $22.9 million in more than 15 sectors, meaning there is not one like the more of the people who believe that the investment in Colombia is more towards uh, mining and oil is more than 15 and the number ones related to the US is uh, professional services, commerce, uh, tourism and other that are not related to the mining and oil, which allows the country to have more employment, knowledge, good practice and development. Definitely one of the greatest opportunities that we have in Colombia is the rural area. And uh, the country is a agribusiness and its entire production chain has a lot of opportunity to offer to an investor that is coming to our country. And that is reflected in the numbers that we have received for the past 10 years. Uh, due to uh, uh, more than 31 countries have informed ProColombia, which is the promotion agency of the country, that uh, they start 132 investment projects for a value of $2.8 million since 2010. The top three countries that are making this uh, investment in our country is the United States with 35%, Chile with 10%, and Peru with 9%. Those three countries accumulate a participation of 54% uh, of the total. The investment, investment is occurring in more than 14 subsectors. It's not only one, it's 
many sectors that uh, investors are finding opportunities in Colombia. And we are seeing that uh, some of the uh, sectors that it's been working very well for different companies are oils and fat, agriculture, agribusiness, poultry, cocoa, meat, cereals, grain, dairy, uh, forestry, fruits, dairy, palm oil, and fat. The top three sectors with the highest participation in terms of amount invested in Colombia is related to agribusiness, uh, forestry, and poultry. Those three are making more than 80% of the investment in the country since 2010. For the U.S., poultry, cereal, and grains, and derivative forestry are the main uh, sectors where investment can be found from the U.S. company. Uh, there is uh, some of this result are part of the uh, incentives, policies, and opportunities of uh, what Colombia have been working since many years ago, more than 10 years or more than 15 years, that the country has been working to strengthen relation between investors and the government, the policies, and developing new incentives in order to be attractive for everyone internationally. Some of the incentives that can be highlighted, uh, additional to what Emilio had just mentioned, is exception income to companies, income tax deduction, special economic social zones, SOMAC, which are the areas more affected by the conflict with the reduction of uh, payment of income tax until 2027, where Emilio explained a little bit, uh, explained a lot about related how the investment can be uh, work in this area. And free trade zones where they would have an income of 20% and exception in VAT and tariff. However, of all this uh, success, we can say on a country that Previously, it was not an idea that we would be able to attract investment in certain areas of our country, which we have. Uh, we do have uh, a, a working plan that is being developed between the different associations, the government, especially uh, with SAC, which is the Association of Agriculture in Colombia, where we have been highlighting 13 cross-cutting issues that could threaten the sector to become agriculture reserve for the world. With uh, It will generate well-being and equity in Colombia, and more importantly, it will maintain uh, Colombians in rural area. We have seen many of the Colombia moving from the uh, rural areas to the main city, which have increased some of the problems of uh, Colombia regarding security and several other issues. So this is one of the main uh, of most important issues that have to be tackled by the government and by all Colombians, as also by investors, is how we can develop the areas where we have opportunity for the rural area in order to maintain uh, our Colombians in, in those areas as well. Of, of these 13 matters, we, uh, I believe there is four that are game changers. Let me start by legal stability. We have done a lot of work uh, related to legal stability, but still there is one that is related to the rural property, which is needed to be advanced. The previous government has uh, developed a law that was uh, not passed through the Congress and it should again be filling up and approved by the Congress because it has uh, four fundamental concepts that it was not easy to achieve. The, the first one is he had a prior consultation mechanism, which is a very long mechanism that have to be done before any investor can get into a countryside, uh, depending on the type of uh, land that is being uh, is going to be used. If it is a land that is a property of indigenous or in an area that have to have this consultation, we already in this uh, law already is being done. So that is one of the issues that should emphasize the need of uh, allowing this law to pass to the, pro to the Congress. The second one is to clarify the concept of expropriation by establishing it as a residual mechanism, which means that the last thing, thing that can be established is expropriation, which is very important for any investor that is coming to our country. The third one is clarify uh, the clarity of the extension of the domain right for non-exploitation. Today, as the, law is, as, as the law is established, if a property is not exploited, property rights can be extended. And considering that according to the peace agreement, 
the government has and uh, must generate a land fund for its allocation, these type of mechanisms, it seems as an opportunity to comply with the norm and provide a lot of uh, a question mark for the investor of uh, how they can apply the mechanism in order to not be uh, included in that type of uh, not exploitation if they don't use the land. We solve land title issues. Uh, the Ambassador Goldberg as well as Emilio thought about um, the land issue that is uh, one of the main issues that is uh, important to investor to have a uh, confidence that the land that are going to be bought is has the right and legal uh, titles. So also that's another issue that was implied into the con into the the project that was uh, not approved by the Congress, uh, but it should again be passed through this process. The second main um, issue that should be tangled and it was talked previously is the road energy and digital connectivity. Many of the uh, lands that we have with great opportunity for many type of products uh, to be uh, uh, in our country, to, to produce in our country, are related to cities and uh, areas where there is no enough roads, energy and digital connectivity allowing a not very uh, interesting competitivity for the investors that are coming to our country. The third one is the labor structure. We, we do have uh, a labor structure that allows several uh, opportunity for any investor, but there is two issues that might be of uh, importance that should be uh, addressed in order to improve and have a huge amount of investment that we can have because the opportunities are there. One is the flexibility of hiring to allow the companies that are uh, working on the rural area that are investing and are producing in areas where there is a hard uh, way to get there as well as to provide development in certain areas where there is not development to have flexibility in hiring. Also, uh, different type of modalities of work which allowed the companies to also have opportunity of how they can best uh, employ someone in order to be productive in those areas. The fourth and last is strengthening the business competitiveness and network. Uh, there is a huge need in Colombia to increase the knowledge from the companies and the entrepreneur that we have in our country. From a business point of view, and working with the, the, and with the different works that is being developed with the government because it's something that is under development with the Ministry of Commerce. We have worked a lot in improving those areas. The following can be highlighted. Look at uh, Colombia for its potential and with a minimum investment ticket. Sometimes investors are looking for opportunity with tickets of more than $5 million, where in Colombia, there is a very few number of companies that can accomplish this uh, amount. So one of the issues that we are working on with every investor that is interested in our country is to explain a little bit about the culture and the development of the companies in Colombia, how they are conformed, and the opportunities that it can be accomplished through an investment in our country. In most cases, investors are looking for vertical integration companies, and in Colombia, there are a limited number of those. Many companies from different sectors are concentrated on the domestic market, not on export. We are not an exporting country. However, we have increased the number of export related to agribusiness and agricultural products. Also, we have increased the number of uh, trade agreements with more than 13 trade agreements in the past 10 years, allowing any investor that are located in Colombia to be part of a more broadened uh, consumer through this trade agreement. And the structure of the companies uh, are um, very uh, familiar companies. More than 90% of the companies in Colombia are still owned by private companies, by, by a family, which means that there is a process that has to be done through um, improving the opportunity of alliance, joint venture, and so forth in order to be part of this uh, opportunity that the country has offered. Thank you very much, Maria Clelia. I know that you're going to have to leave early, so um, you just jump off when you need to. Um, Dan Restrepo. 
Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, it's a real honor to be at the Wilson Center, even if virtually, um, and particularly to be on this panel uh, with my fellow panelists um, who, with whom I have all worked quite closely uh, over the years. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can keep to my seven allotted minutes um, and focus very much on this question of kind of what is the role of the United States in all of this? Um, and I think it's really important to start from a point um, that's been implicit in much of what we've heard, um, and particularly in Councilor of Chile's views. Um, the United States, but far more importantly, Colombia and the Colombian people have sacrificed way too much to fall short of what has been, um, and we have to be clear-eyed about this, kind of Colombia's existential challenge um, as long as Colombia has been a going concern. Um, and that is the cultural, social, political, and economic integration of Colombia's periphery into the country. Um, and as my, you know, my last name is something of a tell here, Colombia is not just something um, I work on professionally. Uh, it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I've seen, you know, the ugly side of this. I've seen the difficult side of this um, through familial experience in kind of the dark days um, that Ambassador Goldberg talked about earlier. I'm um, in the dark days that Emilio and, and Maria Claudia know far better than I. Um, but I think it's super important that we not lose sight of that. So the question is, what is it that the United States can do to help? Um, and how can the United States, uh, what is their unique about the toolbox that the United States has to help? Because it's super important that this work be the work of Colombia and Colombians. Uh, it's very heartening to hear uh, Dr. Archila talk about listening to the voices of the communities themselves. Um, that's something that has not happened as a historic matter in Colombia for far too long. I mean, it's something that is still a challenge today. I think the process, the PADET process has been a very welcome one, um, but we gotta all admit that there are real risks and threats to social and community leaders across Colombia today. And I think we also need to understand that those threats are, are multiple. Uh, they don't all stem from the illicit economy in Colombia. Uh, Colombia's uh, violence has been multifaceted, um, and the response to that violence needs to be multifaceted. So I think we need to be uh, very clear about that as well as a matter of U.S. policy. And also as a matter of U.S. policy, I think we need to do everything we can to help Colombia not do what unfortunately is part of a sad legacy in Colombia, uh, which is kind of seeding the next conflict during periods of relative peace. Um, so what's the role of Colombia Crece of the DFC in all of this? Um, I, well, I think it's an interesting tool, um, but I think it's just that, it's a tool. And it's a tool that is, whose use needs to be guided again, first and foremost by Colombia and Colombians. But even within the United States government, I think it needs to be guided by experts. Um, and we have a lot of resident expertise in the United States government over the, uh, as a function of the last 20 years of engagement. That resident expertise sits at the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Uh, and USAID. Uh, it's not at DFC. DFC is a fledgling organization with very little resident capacity or expertise um, in the problem set um, and in the intractable problem set that we're talking about in Colombia. Um, so we need to make sure, and I think it's very important that this administration and any that may come after it, um, ensure that we're listening to the people who actually know the problem set um, and are respectful of their views and what, how it is that the DFC can be helped. And there are limits to the DFC utility in all of this. Um, Colombia as a government has access to, to, to credit, um, has access to credit at very good rates. Um, so I think we need to ask ourselves, what is the value add? What is that difference maker? What's the differential aspect of credit available through DFC uh, for this kind of work? And it, it may turn out to be somewhat more limited than we'd all like it to be. Um, but I also think we need to think a little bit more creatively about how we utilize this tool. Um, we have for a long time, um, talked about kind of crop substitution as kind of the way of thinking about replacing illicit crops with licit crops. And we've evolved in that and listening both to the ambassador and to the Dr. Chile, um, we're starting to realize we need to replace markets. We need to replace illicit markets with licit markets. Um, but it may be that those licit markets need some goosing, some need some accelerant. And there it may be that the DFC and its both equity and financing mechanisms 
um, could be creatively used. There's an idea that's been out there kind of kicking around in the ether for a while. I first heard it from Andres Cadena at McKinsey in Bogota um, of a kind of G to G commercializer for these new licit markets um, for products that may not today be globally competitive, um, but could be with some support, some initial support. Um, Colombia itself has a history, has a very proud history of a rural cooperative that has been very successful in the global markets, uh, in the coffee industry. Uh, New Zealand today has a very successful uh, rural cooperative in the dairy industry that is one of the larger corporations going that started as a subsidized and is still a subsidized uh, endeavor. So I think we need to think carefully and, 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 and again, guided by Colombians, starting from the bottom up, from the grassroots up, um, ensuring that those voices can be heard and aren't extinguished, um, that they are adequately protected, um, but then also listening to experts within our own government um, to make sure that we are um, not infatuated with a new tool, not you know, the fairy dust of the DFC is not going to answer every question. Um, and I'm afraid right now it's kind of being used that way, uh, at least by some in the United States government. Um, we have a lot of resident capacity. We have sacrificed an enormous amount. Colombia has sacrificed far more. Um, we need to make sure that in this moment, the U.S. is working hand in hand with our Colombian partners, guided by our Colombian partners, um, to ensure that we're doing our part, that distinct, unique, what's the U.S. value add part, um, to helping solve what has been the in, unsolvable problem for all of Colombia's history. Uh, and we should be clear-eyed that it has been an unsolvable problem. It's closer to being solved today than it has ever, ha ever has been, uh, but that doesn't mean what the work that lies ahead is gonna be easy uh, for Emilio Archila or for the Colombian private sector or for Colombian society. And my timer just went off, so I'll stop there. Dan, thanks so much. Um... You've been all very respectful of the time. Since Maria Claudia has to uh, leave, I'm gonna direct one question to her and then I'm gonna turn to a question that it's arri has arrived via Twitter um, from Sergio Gomez, the Washington correspondent of El Tiempo. Uh, so for Maria Claudia, you um, have talked a lot and, and we have had conversations about um, land titling, which was one of the issues you mentioned in your presentation that an investor in rural areas is gonna wanna know whether or not you know, the company has title to the land. Um, and Ambassador Goldberg mentioned you know, the titling that started in, in Ovejas. Um, and it's important progress, but it's still a tiny, tiny percentage of the universe of the, um, you know, of, of the households that need to, be, um, um, need to get title to their land and where that clarity has to come. So I wanted to ask Maria Claudia if you could address specifically ways that you think the land titling process can be made more effective, efficient, you know, without sacrificing the fundamental rights of, um, of people in rural areas? As, as I mentioned, Cynthia, there is a, a project, a law project that is being done and has a lot of uh, issues that would help to emphasize and to clarify how the lands can be used to clarify the context, not only of the title, but expropriation, also the information regarding the consultation, the prior consultation that has to be done. So one of the main issues that it will be very important, as mentioned previously, is to go to work with this pro uh, law project, to present it to the Congress and to have it a feeling and approval. Why? Because it will allow to have a lot of clarification regarding all these issues. Also, it's very important to clarify that uh, even though there is uh, huge opportunities in several areas where we used to have a conflict and now they are in the process of having those areas to be useful and develop for the productive uh, change, there is a huge amount of properties and land in Colombia that they are legal and they still have a lot of opportunity to present to any investor that are coming. So we have to clarify that it's not all the country that is uh, with the title uh, problem is certain areas where is uh, the, that it, there is the need, but those areas are part of uh, what we see as a great of potential for any investor to to produce any type of produce in our country 
where they can develop it, sell, and be competitive to, uh, to uh, from Colombia. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Sergio Gomez's question. Um, hold on to your hats. We're getting right into U.S. domestic politics. Um, the question is that President Trump recently said that Vice President Biden had surrendered to narco terrorists by supporting the peace agreements. Uh, do you agree with that statement? Um, that is a question, uh, according to Sergio, for Ambassador Goldberg, for Dan Restrepo, for Emilio Archila, whoever wants to take that, if anyone. I think that is not to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who wants the politicos to respond? Does anybody? I'll, 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 I'll jump on that grenade. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, look, there's a partisan answer here, um, but the, the partisan answer would be part of the problem. Um, and what the president is doing, I think, is, is problematic. Um, one of the nice things and one of the healthiest things about the U.S. Columbia relationship over the course of the past 20 years, and it sounds like a cliche because it's repeated over and over again, um, but it has been true. Um, it has been a source of great bipartisan cooperation. Um, Democrats and Republicans don't always see the problem set the same, don't always see the solution set the same, um, but they've always been sure um, to understand the importance of Colombia and the importance of Colombia for the United States um, and to treat it as such and to treat the relationship as something of strategic value um, and not something for uh, petty partisan gain. Uh, and unfortunately, the President of the United States, this President of the United States, as he has on so many other things, um, has departed from that convention. Um, he is you know, trying to scare up some votes in South Florida. Um, I think that line in his teleprompter, uh, which he clearly read with some difficulty, um, was uh, looking for votes in South Florida. Um, I think it tells you more about what the uh, internal Trump campaign polls might look like um, than it does about a statement of US policy um, in any meaningful way. Um, this relationship is important. This relationship should not be politicized. This relationship should not be politicized by Americans and it should not be politicized by Colombians. Um, and uh, as Sergio knows, um, I've also opined on that second topic um, in recent days, um, but in the same spirit, I think it's very important that we not attempt to mix the domestic partisan politics of the two countries. They are different. They correspond to different logic. Um, and both countries are very well served by keeping it that way, by keeping them separate. Um, and those who don't um, are fundamentally undermining the relationship in a way um, that I think is deeply unhelpful. And Thanks, as you said, for jumping on that grenade. Uh, do others feel that he has sufficiently absorbed the, uh, the shock or does anyone else want to take on that question? Hearing, uh, hearing no people clicking their unmute button. Um, All right, I'll, jump, oh, I'll, jump, on it just, I'll jump on it just to say that the bipartisan nature of our relationship with Colombia is hugely important for sustaining the kind of support in Congress, uh, in uh, the rest of, uh, of the uh, community of people who are interested in this relationship uh, so that we have the resources to do the kinds of things we were talking about today. It's in the US interest and it's in Colombia's interest. And I won't jump on the political grenade at the moment. Thanks to, to both of you. Um, I have a question now for, um, for Consejero uh, Archila from Sarah Torres, a Colombian recent graduate of Tufts University um, for Emilio uh, to talk about the impact of the pandemic and the lockdown, which is going on now for something like six months. Um, how did that affect the crop substitution um, plans and, and programs that you've been able to implement? Remind others, please, if you if you wish to send a question, uh, please send it to our Twitter account at LatAmProgue. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I mean, the, uh, the, it, it it would be uh, blind to say that uh, that uh, COVID nineteen has not affected uh, every aspect of uh, of the I mean of, of our policies and every aspect of uh, of, of our lives. 
but um, we have uh, been able to uh, respond very strong to what we call a, a, our vulnerable populations. So we uh, worked very strong in order to uh, continue to support the victims. That was a huge effort by the unit of the of the victims, and we continue to give them all the support that they needed in. Uh, in a way, we uh, even went further and uh, changed some of the way that we support uh, so that it will be in, uh, in the way of uh, food and medicine and not always uh, in cash. Uh, we worked very hard uh, in order to uh, protect uh, the 13,000 ex-combats that uh, are uh, within the process of reincorporation. And we have been in fact, uh, I think successful, very few of them were, uh, they had uh, the, the disease and we strengthened the health uh, support we give to them. Uh, we, um, we work uh, very close uh, with uh, UNODC in the provision of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the elements that are required for, by the people that are in voluntary substitution. And we uh, put in more money and more uh, cap capabilities so that we did not stop or delay those, uh, those deliveries. And we continue to, to make all payments that were, uh, that were due. And, um, and last but not least, uh, we designed uh, a specific uh, um, contingency program for the 170 municipalities. Uh, in this, we got uh, uh, the support of the uh, multi, uh, uh, the MPTF, the fund uh, that is administered by the, the UN, uh, that was uh, more or less $5 million, additional $5 million that go in line with uh, the PEDET planning of, uh, of health. And we also got a uh, very strong support by, uh, by USAID, uh, in particular in the provision of, um, um, of the um, uh, special units, uh, units that were required in several places, uh, particularly in, uh, in Catatumbo. So uh, I think that um, we uh, passed a very tough um, uh, test in which our long-term vision of all these plans were not obscured or redirected because of the, of the requirements of the pandemic. Thank you. I have some other questions, but I want to address this one to Ambassador Goldberg. This one is, is from me. Um, when Secretary Pompeo traveled to Colombia earlier this month, um, the State Department put out a fact sheet which indicated that the US goal in coca eradication um, was to reduce cultivation as well as cocaine production um, by 50% of the 200 of the 2017 levels um, by 2023, which is really only three years from now. So given everything that we know about the difficulties that uh, Emilio Archila and others have raised, um, how uh, you know people replanting um, the higher yields of of, uh, of of coca bushes? I mean, how realistic do you think this goal is? Well, it's an ambitious target, and uh, one that we set actually. I think it was at the end of the Santos government uh, that this was going to be uh, the goal. It was reiterated uh, early in the uh, Duque administration. Uh, the goal for this year is 130,000 hectares of eradication. And after a, a start that uh, a little slow this year, in part probably because of COVID, but uh, the first half of the year was slower last year too. Uh, in fact, I, I spoke to the defense minister this morning. We seem to be uh, on target for that. But it is an ambitious uh, target. You have to remember, Sydney, there were three... Uh, different ways we went about uh, the deep reduction in uh, coca production and uh, interdictions uh, from 2002 to 2012 when we were doing Plan Columbia. One was manual eradication, there was uh, uh, aerial eradication, and there was a, a, a very strong effort at going after uh, certain groups that were more identifiable and uh, targetable, if you will, uh, it's not a very nice term to use, 
uh, at least from our perspective in terms of the counter narcotics uh, and to some extent the counter terrorism effort. Uh, and right now we, we don't have the uh, aerial at our disposal and we don't uh, have uh, the same sort of structures in the countryside uh, that are uh, aligned uh, against these efforts. So it, it's a different situation. That in part is why we're adding, I think, or emphasizing the kinds of programs and policies that uh, Emilio Archilo was talking about through the PADETs, through the Zonas Futuro, uh, to add additional tools, uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, to our uh, ability to deal with these issues. It's a very ambitious target. Uh, we are on the way this year to carrying out what we committed to carry out, what the Colombian government committed to carrying out, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, and, and we hope at some point to have additional eradication tools also, uh, such as Ariel, uh, to, to use. It'll be done in a much more limited way probably than before because of court decisions and environmental and other issues that are involved here in Colombia. But uh, we will uh, continue to try to meet those targets. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Kevin Fandel. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, who is a professor of business law uh, at American University, has also been an attorney uh, for US immigration and and customs enforcement, as well as for the US Trade and Development Agency. Um, the question has to do with, um, with China and Chinese investment in Colombia. Um, with increasing investment, including from Huawei, um, how has this affected the US-Colombian relationship uh, in any noticeable way? Um, I don't know who wants to take that, Ambassador Goldberg. That might be another one. Yeah, I can, I, I can take that one. Okay. Uh, clearly, China is making more efforts uh, here in Colombia than uh, it has in the past. Uh, Colombia has not been a central focus of Chinese efforts uh, in investment uh, and in looking for natural resources as in some other countries in the region, uh, but it is doing so uh, uh, more uh, and more. Uh, I don't think it's had the same impact here as it has in other countries, in part because our strategic relationship is such that uh, America is the preferred uh, partner in business, economics, uh, as well as in the kinds of uh, military and uh, economic, or I should say, development uh, programs that we partner on. Uh, Huawei is here. Uh, their advertisements are all over the place. Uh, we're, what we're, we're most concerned about is the development, when it happens, of a 5G program. Uh, and uh, we have made it clear that those are national security concerns, not just economic concerns uh, for the US. If we are partners and strategic partners and we work together as militaries and in intelligence cooperation, it's all the more necessary to have secure networks. Uh, and uh, I think that message has gotten across. Uh, if Maria Claudia was here, uh, she would tell you that we've discussed this many times with AmCham, with other uh, business groups uh, in Colombia. They are involved in 4G, uh, they are selling equipment. Uh, we uh, are also uh, competing in other areas. Maria Claudia also mentioned that we are still by far the largest foreign investor here. We wanna keep it that way. Uh, of course, investment decisions are made on a different basis by US companies than uh, some of the Chinese companies that uh, will tell you that they are private, but when in fact they are uh, backed by the uh, Chinese government. One area where we don't compete as well, quite frankly, uh, because we don't have companies as interested is in infrastructure. And there, uh, the Chinese have been active here on a relatively small basis, but uh, when, when you compare it to some other places in the world, but they uh, did win the contract for the uh, Bogota Metro uh, and have begun uh, the engineering uh, uh, the engineering uh, aspects of it uh, with people having come in even during the COVID uh, emergency. 
So, uh, the, and there's a, a railroad from uh, part of Condina uh, Marca into um, uh, Bogota that uh, they've also uh, gotten. We don't do as well on infrastructure. Uh, there are some barriers that we're working through AmCham and with other uh, groups and the government to try to change to make it more attractive. We hope that the DFC contribution will help in that regard too and do some of the more traditional uh, kinds of investing and uh, loans that OPIC had been involved with before DFC took over those uh, responsibilities. So uh, the, the short answer is we are uh, looking at what China does here. We want it to be an even uh, playing field. Uh, I think Colombia understands that. And on the more strategic issues, how important it is to the United States and uh, Colombia's uh, most uh, strategic partner. Thanks. Dan, did you want to add to that or we can move on? All right, we have time, I think, for one last question. Um, and this one is on um, uh, the protection of indigenous groups. It's from a group called Healing Bridges that works directly with the Kofan indigenous people to protect their way of life um, from outside encroachment. So let's address this one to uh, Councillor Archila. Um, both you and Ambassador Goldberg have mentioned that um, the government of Colombia has increased its presence in indigenous territories, but at the same time, massacres have returned and increased. So can you please um, address that issue? Of course. Um, first, uh, let me, uh, I mean, uh, I want to uh, stress that uh, all Colombian lives are very important and uh, the protection of uh, every single indigenous people is a priority for us. So when, when I make my, my description, I will not like to, to give a sense that, uh, uh, that, that anything less than zero deaths uh, is, uh, is our, our goal. But, um, uh, I, I think that uh, it, it, it is relevant to, uh, to have a, the, a broader uh, picture of what had happened uh, after the signing of the agreements with the, with the FARC. And uh, if we have a look uh, at, uh, at that, not only from the view of uh, indigenous people, but uh, in, the, in, in the eyes of, uh, of all Colombians, uh, the bottom line is that we have a much better country than we had uh, five years ago. As, uh, as uh, Ambassador Golder has uh, described, uh, that reduction in all kind of violences, uh, taking in account uh, that that that, uh, that broader view uh, in terms of uh, murders, in terms of kidnaps, in terms of uh, a, a child that that were taken to uh, to violence or war, in terms of um, a, a people affected by mining, our soldiers being killed, and and so. Uh, we have at this moment uh, a, a much peaceful, uh, peaceful country. Uh, th th that is something that uh, it is uh, important to, to bear in mind. Um, after uh, we made the agreements with, uh, with the FARC, that is uh, 13,000 people that were out there uh, killing other Colombians and trying not to be killed. That was the, the biggest guerrilla in Colombia, possibly in Latin America, and uh, definitely one of the most uh, violent. And uh, due to our, uh, our efforts, uh, we have been able to maintain them uh, enthusiastic about uh, the idea of going uh, um, uh, to uh, having surrendered their arms and getting into civil society. Uh, more than 75% of them has answered that they see their own uh, future with, uh, with optimism. Now, when, uh, when Colombia signed the agreement uh, with, uh, with the FARC, uh, this is something that sometimes uh, it's forgotten, but we were aware that uh, the FARC was not the only source of violence in, in Colombia. The Clan del Golfo was out there, the ELN was out there, the Pelusos were out there, um, the, the Mexicans were, were out there. So we took the decision of implementing the agreement, uh, knowing that we needed to uh, face uh, these other um, um, kinds of violence. 
the condition has uh, been getting a little bit more difficult due to the existence of uh, a, a Maduro's dictatorship in, in Venezuela. And uh, the fact that Maduro uh, uh, hosts uh, all these, uh, these groups and that uh, he uh, enabled them to, uh, to hide in Venezuela and to get uh, strengthened there, um, it makes uh, things uh, more uh, more difficult. Now, uh, the, the the line in, in which we uh, need to work uh, as a country is in all sides. We need to uh, to protect them with the presence of the police and the uh, and the military. We need, but at the same time, we need to go to to those places uh, with the public uh, public services. These two tasks do not take them the same time. One thing is to bring the military that you can be done in six hours. And then we need to bring alternative dispute resolutions as uh, we are doing with uh, USAID. And then we need to take the judges and then we need to take the roads and uh, health. But uh, this uh, will all happen in, uh, in different times. So that is uh, the reason why I have uh, so much faith in uh, the way that we are doing it. As, it, uh, as, it as the agreements were introduced in the Colombian constitution, it needs by law to be uh, uh, implemented by three presidents, 15 years. And that is the time that we need in order to cover all those, uh, uh, all, all those aspects. Thank you very much. There are more questions. I apologize to those who whose questions I haven't been able to get to, but please, uh, um, I, I hope all of you virtually will join me in thanking Ambassador Goldberg, um, Emilio Archila, Dan Restrepo, Maria Claudia uh, for a, a really enlightening conversation. Um, the video of this event will be on our website, um, hopefully in a matter of hours. Um, thank you again for joining us and we look forward to continuing our focus on the US-Colombian relationship. Thanks so much, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andy.